Hey everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Gonna go a little bit uh, out of order on the timeline today, skip past War of the Spider Queen, just because I feel like, uh, let's go ahead and finish off talking about the Sembia stuff today. Also gonna kind of start a new series, which doesn't really fit in well with the way that I wanted to skip past the timeline, but I feel these two books fit really nicely together thematically, so we're gonna talk about both of them. Also, really quickly, want to mention Blade Singer by Keith Francis Strom, which I was really looking forward to because Keith Francis Strom, such a strong Germanic name and a fighter book, and I thought, all right, awesome, this is just going to be wall to wall action in that awesome Swanland cover. Sadly, totally didn't work for me. I think I got like 30 or 40 pages in, and I was still in prologues. It was like it had like seven different prologues from years past, and it's like elves find a baby, and then there's this and that and I just, I was like, none of it hooked me. You know, I am totally okay with a book having a slow burn. Uh, my favorite book right now is Toll the Hounds, in which we have about 800 pages before you even find out what the plot is. But it's just, it, it hooks you. It's written so well that I didn't care about that. I, I just, I was there for the writing. And so I think if you have a slow burn, like for instance, George R.R. R. Martin, I'm not a huge fan of his stuff, but uh, I got through the first two books, yeah, of uh, Song of Ice and Fire, and, you know, they're pretty slow burns, and you have, like, 37 main <laughs> characters introduced in the first one, but he writes it in such a way that each one has a hook, and each one has strong personality introduced quickly enough that you feel connected to the character. You know, you, you might not, it might not work for you. I know plenty of people told the hounds it didn't work for. It's, it's definitely a gamble to do things that way. So it might not work for you, but I think you have to do that. Whereas this was just kind of like, I'm just going to present the story and either you're here or you're not. And I was not. So let's go ahead and finish off the Sembia series, Gateway to the Realms, I guess it's called, with Lord of Stormweather by Dave Gross, who also wrote Black Wolf. And I'm really kind of shocked that it wasn't um, Greenwood or Clayton Emery who wrote this book, considering they both wrote short stories in the original short story compilation for the Sembia stuff which introduced all these novels, and neither of them wrote a novel in here, yet Dave Gross already had written one. So it seemed like, you know, I felt like part of the reason for doing this and putting Greenwood's name on the beginning was to introduce new authors, much like War of the Spider Queen is going to do, and we'll talk about that next time. But for whatever reason they had Dave Gross do it, my assumption is there was some sort of time issue or contractual issue, like Clayton Emery got handed a Star Trek book or something, you know, that paid better, and he was like, hey guys, do you mind if I bow out? And they were like, okay, we understand, you know, something like that. Because a lot of these genre authors kind of switch around a lot, or Greenwood was originally going to do it, and they thought, you know, having him end out the series, we, we want people to, you know, pick it up because of other reasons, and so we just, we don't want to put his name on a whole book, or, you know, whatever. In any case, I'm really glad that Dave Gross did write the last book, because I really like his writing style, and find him just easy to read. I mean, he's, uh, he's one of these guys who... His books aren't necessarily deep or meaningful most of the time, but he has a few little spots that really pop out to me. You know, I, th I think Black Wolf was probably the weakest thing by him that I've read. Now I've read that, this, and one of the Pathfinder books that he wrote, which was awesome, just amazing. So I'm assuming he's just getting better and better, which is great. And that book actually got a sequel, so I really want to read that. And I guess a prequel that you can read for free online. So I gotta find a way to read that at some point. Anyway, digression. Point being, I really like Dave Gross's writing. It just feels fluid, I guess. It, it, it flows really quickly. And even in the stuff in this where I might skim descriptions or segues from other authors, I, I find his stuff really enjoyable to read because it's just presented in a way that moves quickly. It, it, it reads the way that my mind interprets things, I guess. You know, like... Even some of Stephen King's worst stuff, and, you know, it's debatable which that is, right? Because everybody has their favorites or whatever. But even some of his worst stuff, generally I can read very quickly because he just, he talks like I think. So that makes it much easier to read. And I guess Dave Gross must be similar, even though I don't find their style similar. Anyway, point being, I really enjoyed Lord of Stormweather for a multitude of reasons. I want to say that the other book I'm going to talk about here is The Sapphire Crescent by Thomas M. Reed. 
starting off the uh, Scions of Arabar series. And, and the reason I feel these two fit very closely together is they're very much about kind of a house divided and, uh, you know, the traitors within the house and how that's resolved, etc., etc., etc. want to point out a couple of things here. Something that I've noticed with 3rd edition and... I, it kind of started in the later second edition, I think. It's been so long since I've even kind of looked at where we were at the end there. I can't remember if I pointed this out in that Richard Baker book, the uh, the Stone of Evil or whatever the hell it was called. We're getting away from adventuring parties at this point. And I think that's interesting, and it frees up the authors a lot. I mean, you know, most of the Sembia stuff is essentially solo adventures, if you will. I mean, Erebus Kale, you know, he has Jack Fleet, and once we get to the Twilight Falling stuff, I'm pretty sure he adds more people. Like, the one thing I remember about Twilight Falling is the climax, and I remember there's a psionicist introduced who I believe becomes part of the party, and I like Sionesis, so I was like, woo! But anyway, you know, it's, um, uh, we're getting away from that idea of an adventuring party overall, and I like that. You know, I think it's fine, and I think it has its place, and it, it's cool that I, I think Salvatore's gonna get back to that. You know, he's had a few books where it's like, it's just Wolfgar, or it's just Drizzt, etc., 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 but I think he's gonna kind of come back to that when we next visit Salvatore. I think both types have their place, you know, dealing with an adventuring party and dealing solo, but I think just writing parties can get tiresome. Like, for instance, Sapphire Crescent, I mean, technically we have a party of, like, an assassin, a, I don't know if he's a, a paladin, maybe? I'm not sure. And uh, a rogue, and a cleric. But they're not really, like, out adventuring together, they're just all working towards the same goal within the same book. And in Lord of Stormweather, we have the entire family working together. So it's like we have a, uh, man, I don't know what Talbot would be. By the way, so sorry that I got the names completely wrong. I really should have looked that up, but I got halfway into talking for Black Wolf and realized, oh crap, everybody's name starts with T, and I don't remember who it is. But Talbot's the werewolf, you know, so he's, I guess, a fighter, but he's also like an actor, so he has that flair to him. I don't know, uh, Tazzy's obviously a, a, a rogue. You know, uh, Kale's like a rogue assassin type, uh, rogue rogue priest by the end of it. Tamlin becomes essentially a wizard or a sorcerer by the end of this. No, a wizard, he still needs components that make a um, point of mentioning that. And then um, Thamelon, I, I don't know if he actually has any powers. I, I guess he's a rake. Uh, and Shamu, who's also a, a rogue. So it's, you know, and, and they're pretty much all working together in here. And there's probably somebody I skipped. Oh, Larigen, who's also a priestess, a cleric. So, and, and, and in that one, essentially, they do all work together come the climax. But through most of the book, it, it's them in separate bits and pieces working together. Or, you know, working towards the same goal, not working together. So that's a trend that I'm really digging. I think it's a sign of the Realms books growing up somewhat, and I'm all for that. You know, we don't need every book to be about heartache or whatever uh, for them to grow up, and I mean, they really already have. I mean, look at Night Parade, you know, just this ruthless <laughs> story involving motherhood. I mean, that, that was, you know, the Realms books have been grown up for a lot longer than people realize, I think. But the writing style and the choices that people can make, I think, have grown up a lot. You know, it's like the, the Warhammer books. As much as I enjoy them, you definitely feel like there are certain parameters. And Dan Abnett has just come out and said this, that, you know, every book needs to feature at least one large battle between two groups because they are, after all, essentially there to augment the miniatures. Whereas Realms Fiction, I think, now isn't so much necessarily supporting playing D&D, &D, but supporting the world, because now, at this point, it's branched out in so many different ways, you know, um, with the computer games and different, you know, I, I'm sure there are other things that I don't even know about, you know, by now, board games, I don't know if there were many at the time, etc., 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 it feels like the world is its own entity, and the kind of adventuring party stuff that goes with D&D &D is just part of that. That was apparently a much larger point than I thought it would be. That went on for quite some time. Let me just briefly run through the plots of both books. Uh, Lord of Stormweather is essentially Tamlin's book, and it's all about him taking control of the Askevran household and, you know, the financial, all, all, all sides of it, because his, his father, mother, and Kale go missing. And we find out that they're actually in Tamlin's dream world, 
uh, which was created through, I mean, it's this long, involved story that is totally a MacGuffin, doesn't really matter. Point being, by the end, Tamlin is, or, uh, Thamelon is gone, the dad is gone, and so Tamlin is now the new Lord of Stormweather, for real. I think Gross does a really impressive job of bringing all of the characters and all of their backstories from their other novels into play here in some form or another. Not surprisingly, stuff from his own Black Wolf probably gets the largest mention. I, I'd say Kale and Largen get the least, but you know it's a, a but a lot of the stuff from the earlier books really comes into play. This is mostly Tamlin's book. But it is, in the end, a, a story about the family and about them coming together to protect the house and all of Selgant or Sembia or whatever from a, a threat from within and about, you know, protecting the house but also protecting the land. In a similar vein, Sapphire Crescent, which is really oddly named because the Sapphire Crescent is a mercenary company that really plays very, very little part in the plot. but. I, you know, they liked their color scheme. I, I think more like the Crimson Veil or something like that, or the Crimson Cloak might have fit better if you wanted a, a color adjectiving a noun. But anyway, it's about, you know, this kid who has this, uh, uh, this secret in his past. That really doesn't play in until much later, and in a way that was really obvious, and I'm assuming it wasn't meant to be hidden, but it felt like it should have been. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so it's about him coming back for his sister's 16th birthday, and they get embroiled in this murder mystery that turns out to be a lot more, and in the end it's them protecting their house from ruin from within. So they're both very similar stories, just approached very, very differently. I find the whole idea of family honor and protecting a house and things like that very silly. Don't care about that at all. Has no place in my life, so it's um, it, it, it's kind of strange to be reading a couple of books about that and basically enjoying them, but I just kind of, you know, scoffed at that whole business by the end. So it, it's, you know, your mileage may vary. I understand. You might feel more connection to those parts of the books, but whatever. So let me just say, Lord of Stormweather, Really fun, really good read, really enjoyed it. A lot of lot of good things happening there. And there were only a few chapters where I kind of felt like, okay, we really didn't need this chapter. But even Gross, obviously, kind of realized that. Because some of the chapters that are just there to remind you that the characters are still doing what they were doing are much shorter than the other chapters. So I kind of forgive him for that. I feel like Gross is really finding his muse as a writer and getting better and better at it, which is which is a lot of fun to see progress. Thomas Reed's writing style is interesting as well for a lot of reasons. I actually first started liking him, uh, he, he did, I think it was the Temple of Elemental Evil novel, and I really enjoyed the way that he handled that. This book, much different, because Elemental Evil was just basically a non-stop dungeon crawl, and he just did it in a way that was engaging through the whole thing. I'll be honest, I probably would have given this book up if I hadn't read read stuff before and kind of had placed some trust in him because of that Be because this book has a really slow start and nothing much is happening and you get to this point where they witness this murder um the two main characters vambran and embrya and and you just feel like ah oh, is this going anywhere and then suddenly it turns into like Columbo, <laughs> like it's kind of them interviewing people and piecing together why this murder happened and what it meant and everything. And I really enjoyed that. And I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be like a crime procedural. That's a cool take on the realms. I'm I'm interested in seeing how that goes. And then pretty quickly that's thrown aside and it becomes something else. But through the whole thing. Um, once it kind of hit its stride and it took it a little while, which is frustrating for me because I, I just, I sincerely believe that the beginning of your book is the most important part because you have to hook someone. You know, I'll, I'll slog through a horrible third act if I have something invested in the characters, which sadly I never did in this book. The characters aren't unlikable, but I just never really felt anything for them, and I'm, I, I feel a little bit of trepidation about continuing this series. But we've got some other stuff that'll happen first, so that at least is uh, bolstering my energy there. But I really wish I could just go to all these authors and kind of shake them a little and be like, hook me from the first page. Give me something that's interesting from the first page, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come with you the rest of the way. Luckily, as I say, I stuck with this really enjoyed it uh, through the end. Nothing amazing, nothing world shattering, but I just, I really like the way that Reed writes. I'll admit I skimmed a little bit more through his stuff than I did through Gross's stuff, but still not much. 
And I have to say, I think Reed is probably the best author that we've come across so far when it comes to describing rules-oriented ways that things work in the world in a way where you notice it if you know the rules at least somewhat, but it doesn't impinge on the writing style. I remember, uh, you know, uh, just little things like... Um, you know, people being like, oh, I, I, I can't use that healing spell again today, you know, so or which one of you is worse off? And, and somebody, you know, saying, um, like a priest being like, he could tell that he was using some form of arcane magic, but he wasn't sure what it was, and, you know, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and like, look out, he's spraying acid from his mouth. You know, just uh, the, the way that he writes it, I just felt makes the rules seem valid. You know, sometimes people kind of poo-poo the rules and say these things don't make sense and they try to write around it. Uh, Reed really embraces them and writes them in a way that isn't just stuffing the rules down your throat, but it also approaches them in a way where you're going to know what's going on. I, I really enjoyed that. I'm really trying to make these reviews shorter and I'm obviously failing here, but I have one other point that I want to make. One of the reasons I wanted to talk about these two books together is that Lord of Stormweather especially closes out a chapter on Sembia. You know, it's supposed to be about Sembia. By the end of it, I feel like we should know all these things about Sembia. And when I was reading these two books, because I generally read two or three of the books together at the same time, I realized after a while that they could be occurring in the same city for all that the setting matters in any way, shape, or form. Because essentially they're both about two merchant houses. That doesn't require it be set in any specific city. Sembi, I feel, is more merchant. And I guess Selgant's the city, right? And Sembi is the area. But in any case, I don't feel like I know Selgant uh, versus Erebar or uh, whatever that... I think Erebar is the region and we have a different city. But the city might be Erebar too, anyway. Doesn't matter. Point being, I didn't feel like I knew the area in any way that mattered. You know, I, I kind of feel like I know Waterdeep at this point. I feel, I, I wouldn't say confident with it, but I feel decently comfortable with it. You know, we're going to have uh, the tower out there at some point, and the, the lords of Waterdeep act in a certain way, etc., etc., etc. But it's like, Sapphire Crescent could have happened in Sembia, I feel, and Lord of Stormweather could have happened in Erebar for all that were given about the, the towns um, or the regions. And I felt like this was especially true when you look at the Sembia series as a whole. There's just not much there that makes me feel anything about Sembia. I don't know if others felt the same way. I know that somebody said they read the Kale book and just felt like Sembia came alive in it, and they really felt like they were going through the alleys and da 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 and I'm like, man, I don't, I don't recall that at all. I mean, I, you know... Sure, there was some setting, but it, it wasn't a flavor that jumped out to me in any way. I mean, I liked the book, so I'm at a loss here as to why that is, why it feels like I don't know anything about Sembia except the fact that there are merchant houses in it. I guess it feels like the books, while I enjoyed most of them overall, they kind of failed on that part, and so far Science of Erebar is doing the same thing. But since the series title is Science of Erebar, I'm assuming that we're going to get more about Erebar in the region as we move along. Right now it's all about saving the family and all that sort of crap, and, you know, I, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. But anyway, I wanted to bring that point up. We'll see if that changes as we go along. And especially 3rd edition stuff seems to be kind of focused on this series is supposed to make you know more about this specific thing. You know, we have the fighters, we have the rogues, we or whatever it's called, and we have the, the priests, you know, and uh, uh, the citadels, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it seems like this is the Sembia, you know? And half the books, they go out of town. But I guess the town is Selgon, so maybe they're still in Sembia? I don't know. But it just, it, it just felt like, you know, I just felt like it wasn't cohesive. I'm okay with that, but when you put a series title over something, I feel like it should be in some way, shape, or form. Anyway, we'll see how that progresses further along. As of right now, more just noting it, something to watch out for, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Let's keep going. Next time, more of the Spider Queen. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remember.